let's take a look at a moment for what a formative assessment is. So again, it's saying the, the evidence, the word, e a planned process in which assessment elicited evidence of students. So what, what, did, what does that word mean? Evidence? Yeah, the evidence, evidence is proof. So you, that means you have to have proof or it's proof in your head? Uh, well, it's, it's better when it's something that you could actually look at, I would think. Right. Even if it's just from your head to a piece of paper. So you're writing down what you see as, as a teacher. I, I want to I emphasize with it, when you have a long definition, it's hard to know sometimes what we're going to, but by the way, we're not, I think based on the time that we have, we're not going to get to everything in the packet. I figured, let me put in more, and then we can decide how much time we have and we can cut back appropriately. My goal, my initial intent when we started the conversation, or the goal and I, was to form, focus on the oral testing. So I think that's still going to be the main thrust. And some of the other pieces I will touch on very, very briefly, just to tell you what it is, so you know why I put it in your packet. Um, a formative assessment, in, in, in brief terms, is assessing as we go. It's assessing as we go so that I'm getting regular feedback. So when I did that exercise with you earlier, and I asked you to do like this, for example, or any other similar type of thing, that's called checking for understanding, that's a form of assessment. I'm assessing, did I, was it hopped, was it understood, as we go along. Okay, now it's good for students, for teachers, because it helps me adjust my teaching. It tells me, did, did they get it? How it's do you know for they students got it? Too. I'm sorry? The child will do how do you know they got it? Well, I wouldn't just rely on this at all. That, that's only because they're, you're asking them something specific. So when you see the answer that they give you, you get a feel. Now, when I surveyed the room earlier, and I asked you about rubrics, which I've yet to define, and I saw that at least 50% of the rabbeim put two over here, which was means we didn't, weren't familiar with it, that told me that I need to teach it. Now, had I taught it, and I asked a question about it, and then I got some answers that made me feel like it wasn't understood properly, I would know to reteach it, because that would mean that I didn't do an effective job the first time. And again, for students, it might help them adjust how they approach it. Obviously, if we're talking about younger students, they might not have the mental maturity to rethink how they're learning. You may have to help them with it. Older children already can start to say, well, maybe, maybe if I take notes more effectively, I'll understand it better. Or maybe if I ask more questions, I'll understand it better. Or maybe the, the Rebbe can survey the room and see that it's not working and ask the class, well, what's going on over here? Why aren't we processing this? And what can I do to assist you? Might be a way that you'd want to approach it. Again, every review would be different. A summary of the test, assessment, of course, happens at the end, and it summarizes the unit of learning. It's one test, one body of information that gives me some feedback, but it's not the ongoing piece we talked about before. Are there any questions about the definitions? Because I would like to move forward if we can. But if you're not clear, please ask. So I'll, I'll say one other thing before we move on. A formative assessment, I'm going to assess as I go. The goal of it is to give me ongoing feedback, okay? It's not to put a number in my gradebook. Though it can be, it can be, but that's not its primary purpose, okay? Now this is the nice chakira, so to speak, between the two. It's an assessment for learning, as it is supposed to an assessment of learning. You, by the way, have almost everything at this point in the packet in front of you. Feel free to write notes, whatever you wish to do. For learning means I'm using the assessment as a way by which to make the learning better. Of learning means the learning took place, now I'm assessing. Is that clear? That but it, it could be an assessment of learning. The first one. Sure it can. It could be an assessment of learning. Sure, too. sure, 100% master. But it's also, the difference is there's a finality to this, or to that, summative. There's a lack, there's a, there's a flexibility to this. In other words, here, it's all, you know, all the, 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 the stakes are high. It's, it's, it's high stakes, it's, it, a lot is riding on this. Here, if I mess up, I can go back and redo it, because it's for learning. It's helping me get it. It's not telling me I got it and it's over, okay? Feedback occurs while there's time, it's generally low stakes. It may not have a great value, it may have a small grade value. Somebody asked me earlier about worksheets. Exactly. But that's, that's yeah, what it yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. You use them as that's right. right. That's right, exactly. 
Now, are you going to use it where you make the worksheet, which is typically what we do? You can even do it in a way where the Talmud makes the worksheet. That's also a demonstration of learning. If they create the questions that are designed in a way that say they understand at least what's total you know, they're, they're, they're getting, it's not just, you know, what, what does it say in the Mishnah? That's too loose. But if you could say, you know, identify aspects of the Machlokas or things like that as part of the question, then they're showing that they understand. Because if I can ask you, that means I understand what, what's going on, right? You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the research that talks about the retention level. And if you just listen to me and do nothing else, you might retain 5 to 10% of what's taught today, or what's shared today. If, however, you are forced to now teach it, which is the most extreme on the other end, typically you will remember 90% of what you learned. So the more you can have your Talmudim teach others what they have learned, the more they're going to remember. That could be a Chabura, that could be a Chabrusa, they could even teach a class for five minutes. But the amount that they're going to go into it is got to get a clerk. And Rebbe used to say, I'm sure you've all heard some variation of this, if you can't say it, you don't know it. Reviewed all about, reviewed all about it with my Rebbe embroiders in ninth grade. You can't say it, you don't know it. I don't remember who he quoted. He had another Rebbe that he quoted. Um, that, that, that's the old, the old adage. Okay? But if you can test them, if you can write the test, it's also a demonstration of understanding. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Fine. What are examples? So we talked about checking for understanding. List charts and graphic organizers. Now I'm going to give these to you. We don't have a lot of time to dwell on them, but I'm going to just distribute as I go. Are you familiar with this? It's called a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Venn diagrams, for those who are not familiar, gives you an opportunity to compare and contrast. So let's say, for example, you have a Mahlokas Arishana. Okay, whether it's Chumash, or uh, Gemara, and you want to tell me them to say what's similar between the opinions and what's different. So what's different, you'll put, for example, Rashi over here, and you put Ramban over here. And where they're similar, you put that in the middle. Now, you could write this on a piece of paper. Right? That's not a big deal. But if you put it on a Venn diagram, it's visually appealing, it's very clear, you know exactly what goes where, you could color code it, if that's helpful. All of these could be very beautiful and very nice. Okay? What's the difference between, I don't know, Yom Rishon and Yom Sheni, if you're teaching Bria Salam? He says Kitov, doesn't say Kitov, whatever it is. You know, there are different aspects you can put in a Venn diagram that allows them to see it visually. A cluster. Now, you could do this with your class. You could also do this as a way of seeing afterwards did they really comp what you taught. Have them create a cluster with you. So, for example, in the middle, you're going to put... Um, some kind of macro topic. The topic could be the macros, the topic could be Pesach, the topic could be the Vikas Chametz, I don't know what. And then you've got these four smaller ovals where you kind of branch out into different areas. And then from there you branch out by them. Okay, again, it's a nice way to see the Talmud and be able to um, put the information in in the appropriate type of way, but it's also a nice tool for them because they can see it laid out very neatly in front of them. I don't, I don't know how you, um, children, just a second. I don't know how you um, prefer to, let's say, build a piece of furniture. Let's say you go to Target and you want to build a cheap bookcase. Or we just built, we just bought a shed. Okay? So the shed that comes with a book. And the book's got one, step two, step three, where all your materials are. It also usually comes with some pictures. Sometimes they'll make a video. And you could take your laptop of face and bring it outside to the, to the backyard where you're going to build your shed. And you're going to watch the guy build the shed and you'll build it with him. That goes back to modalities. You have different preferences. There are Talmidim who just, if you say it, it goes in. But the Talmidim, they need to see it. And not just to see it, our phase gimel. The more you can make it sticky. Sticky means the more their brain can make a tfisa on it, the better they're going to hold on to it with greater clarity. And if they grab it the wrong way the first time, they'll hold on to that. You've all heard people say, never say, say Kaddish and Shul. You never got the words right. Or Daven for the Amu, you never got the words right. It's hard to listen to. And it's unfortunate. And they got it buried from, from, from Hebrew school, right? right? You know, whatever the, the error is, and they're still making the error 60 years later. Mm -hmm. I have a close relative who benches with a few consistent mistakes. Consistent mistakes. Years of, 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 of comments, gentle comments, of course, have not helped. 
because it's just been buried in that, in that memory. Yeah, so what did you want to say? This, this is used as, as a on a variety of ways. By the way, just as before I continue, this is accessible. Rabbi Goldberg has the email. It's called eduplace.com. It's a website made from the company Houghton Mifflin. They make textbooks. It's available for replication for free. Because it says clearly that you, uh, even though here it says all rights reserved, it does right. say that. But their website says that you may you may duplicate for educational purposes. So what's supposed to get eduplace.com, and on their website they have graphic organizers. They have many more than what I'm sharing with you. This one is really, this one I would I would I would encourage you to use all the time. It's called the KWL. It says what do I know, what do I want to know. And what have I learned? So give me an example. So let me give you an example. Okay. Health is Pesach. Okay? Maybe an aspect of health is Pesach. What do I know? Have the tell me to tell you. Go through the class. What do we already know? One of the biggest peeves that I have is that we reteach some of the same things year over year to people. They never learned it before. Parashat Shavua, you know, Dinim, things like this. And, and wouldn't it be nice to know, hey, they already know all of this. I can now get into some of the really more sophisticated things, right? Because they've already been granted if it's a year separate between the last time they're in the space, and now they're going to forget a lot anyway, I understand. But if you give them a pretest or you use a, a KWL and you get out of their own mind, what do they already have? Matohu Manoim. What do I want to know? Makes them a partner in the learning. So often the learning is passive. The Rebbe sets the agenda, the Nile sets the curriculum, and the, the student is just a passive agent in the classroom. What do I want to know? And maybe the Rebbe can incorporate some of that. I'm really interested, Rebbe, in how was it that a Kodesh Baruch Hu could make the makos it wasn't fair, whatever it is. Something bothering a Talmud. He wants to know that. You do a little homework, or maybe you know the answer already. And you come to, doesn't he feel like a million bucks? Rabbi, the same Rabbi Olbam, who I quoted before, he had a lot of really wonderful qualities. He often would, on the test, on a, on a worksheet, maybe even on the test, he put the name of the Talmud who would share the idea in the class on the worksheet. He'd then write it up. It was the old stencil days, and still by hand. And he'd write it up, you know, the old crank machine, and he'd give it to us. But it made me feel like a million dollars, and my name was on the sheet because I came up with an answer. Okay? It's a nice, it's a nice Nakuda. And then what I learned, that's going back to your portfolio. Look at all we learned. Let's fill it in together. And we go, we have 30 pieces of information, 50 pieces of information. Wow, we really accomplished something. How often do we leave the celebratory side of our learning on the side? Granted, we make human. But how often along the way do we forget to celebrate? If you don't give people satisfaction of what they're doing as they go, they tend to lose motivation and interest. But if you look how much we're learning, and here's the evidence, that feels very special. The next one it could be used on a variety of levels, certainly for Gemara, but I think for Kumish as well. It's called a step-by-step -step chart. And really, very simply, we can call it a Shaku Vitaria chart. Okay, of course, if you want to use this for your Gemara share, you might want to change the verbiage to make it a little bit more Heimish. But the same basic Nikuki, right? Just laying it out visually, step one, step two, this way, you tell me you can see it, you can provide the details. Now this one is for you. All these are for you, but this one is for you as part of your, your, your plan. This one is called a multiple intelligence lesson plan. It has nothing to do with checking front, or, uh, nothing to do with formative assessment, but I figured if I'm already gonna talk about graphic organizers, I may as well give this to you because for me, it's a different website by the way, you can find it on the bottom of the page. It doesn't come from Houghton Mifflin. But what's nice about it is it holds you accountable to something you anyway want to do. Right? <laughs> when I am giving a, um, a workshop, I want to hold myself accountable. Am I, remember before I listed the modalities? And I think we got five at least when we were talking. We talked about verbal linguistic, visual, spatial. You have, the, you have the screen, you have the paper in front of you. I haven't sung yet, but we'll do musical later maybe. Uh, we'll do musical chairs, that much we will do, although we'll have to see if there's a piano in the room. Interpersonal we've done, intrapersonal we've done, bodily kinesthetic we've done, we've moved around, we've talked, and logical mathematical, we've definitely done, we've spent a lot of logic, and I do want to tell you, as I said, I've been extremely pleased and impressed with the, um, the conversation, and I thank you, just, I know we're not done, but I thank you for, for the candor and the reflection and the, con the, the, the give and take, because that's how we learn. 
for me to just sit here and say whatever I have to say, and you not to, when I say push back, I don't mean in a negative sense, but for you not to ask and to delve and to probe, it's not going to be helpful for you. But if you're really asking questions that you, you're I can see it, you're taking it, you're putting it into your classroom context, you're saying, how is this going to work for me? What can, what makes sense for me? That's how we get really a winning workshop that, that makes a difference for our learning. So thank you so much for that. And I didn't want to forget that as we go. So these are examples of formative assessment. Okay. And even asking your, your students to do a one or two sentence response. Now that's, by the way, how I segue. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on the summit side. We probably got this part, right? Okay. Um, here are some of the graphic organizers I shared with you, more or less the same thing. This is what we didn't have on the paper, problem solution. Problem solution you have in different narrative in Homer sometimes. You certainly have it in Gemara. What was the problem? The Gemara attempted to resolve it this way, or to write against it, try to resolve it another way, or to write against it, you know, that kind of thing until we loop back or whatever the ultimate outcome is of the Gemara. Beautiful way by which to tie it all together, see it very visually. Um, there is a company, it's very expensive, I don't know if you've ever even had this conversation, it's called the Marabura, it's a program, they allow you, are familiar with it? Mayor Fockler is the one who runs it. Um, they basically allow you to turn the Gemara into a visual flowchart with color and with shape. So it's very clear what's going on in the Gemara at this, at this particular time. But again, it's an expensive program and you have to really be committed to it, I think, in order for it to work for you. Okay. Now, very quickly, a one-minute paper, because I do want to get to the oral test. The one-minute paper ties into this bullet point right here. Okay? The idea that you're asking them to write a couple of sentences, not a lot, just a couple of sentences that's going to demonstrate that they hopped what you were teaching. Now, a one-minute paper is typically designed to be done at the end of the lesson, or maybe better, at the end of the section of the lesson. One of the things we tend to do is we tend to throw a lot of information at all to meet them at a time. One of the things that I've learned to do through my own professional training, others sharing with me, is chunking the information. Giving them a manageable amount, let them process it, check for understanding, get that far, and then let it suit the next chunk. If you have too much information, right, you've ever had that where they just throw a lot at you and your brain can't be tight with it, too much information doesn't work. Small, digestible chunks are key. So whenever you choose to do it, but the idea is a one minute paper gives you an opportunity for easy, digestible feedback. And you can frame it any way you wish. The conventional way would be questions like this. What's the most important thing you learn in class today? Now, it's a little bit difficult to do if you're teaching Torah, because you have to be, it's a shy love, can you be you know, asking the Talmudim to weigh in what's more important? Maybe that's not how you want to frame it. But what's something that you learned today that really is meaningful to you? Maybe that's a way to frame it. Something where you're getting them to actually think about what I'm talking about, what they learned today. When I was teaching college classes, I would ask them to write three points from the reading that they thought were meaningful. At least it tells me they read the, they read the chapter. There's something there, you know? They're able to distill three important ideas, okay? What unanswered question do you still have? And often that's just a matter of lack of clarity, okay? Three significant points made in the class, any of these kinds of things. Where do you want more clarification? What was meaningful to you? You can frame it any way you want, but it's giving you real feedback. And so you go home, you spend an hour plus on the bus, on the train, you know, you know, at home at night. You can flip through the papers. You know, did they get it? Did they understand what's going on in, in, in the material that I, that I was teaching? So it's a really nice way to get that feedback. Here's a picture you can find, if you were to Google one minute paper, you'll find many samples online. Okay. You can see it's usually a sheet like this with open space, giving them an opportunity to, uh, to write what they want to write. Now, you want to do it anonymously to encourage more feedback. That's one way to go about it. You want to do it where they're writing their names so you know to talk to them directly. That's another way to approach it. They should know that it's safe and that you're not going to judge them for opening up to you and telling you that they talked ahead some lack of clerk. Right? Right? If, if they know that the goal here is to learn, not to be assessed, then they're going to open up to you. And they'll tell you what's on their mind. And they'll give you that feedback that, that you need. And you'll tell them, it's not for you, it's for me. It's probably for you too, but it's for me. And they'll feel better about it, I think, if you do it that way. Any comments or questions? Please. I think part of the maybe confusion for me to ask about this, where are these papers supposed to go? Where are they, am I supposed to get it back? You, you collect it. And then you give it back the next day if you choose to. You may not give it back. If it's anonymous, you can't give it back. 
If it's not anonymous, you can write some comments on it. You could say anything from, we'll discuss it first thing tomorrow, or please see me. You yeah, know? What do they do with that paper? Then they say, the, paper, the, paper is, the, the paper is not, this paper is not meant for anything long term. It's just for you to gauge as you go. That's for me, but for them, like, should I hold on to it already? Should I not hold on to it? What should I do? So let them, let them give it to you. And once they've given it to you, you keep it. Or you give it back if you choose to. But ultimately, it's cash. The main thing is it's got, I thought you were going to say something different. I thought you were going to say that the issue is that we teach and teach and teach and we don't get the feedback until the foundation has been built kind of like off. Remember, Desso talks about this in a different Nikuda. He says if your foundation is off even by a millimeter or the smallest measurement, then the entire building will you know, lean towards Pisa, right? You know, you'll have that, that, that imbalance that you don't want. The foundation always needs to be solid. So that's really, when you're building your foundation, whether, whatever that is, skills, content, you've got to get that feedback. You've got to know that your foundation is, is solid. Otherwise, whatever comes afterwards is going to be crumb in some type of way. That's why you have some kind of problem. There's a, a, a very obvious <clears throat> disparity in class. Like when you're starting the circuit, you're starting the foundation. Yes. And one boy's absent. Uh huh. It's very difficult. It is impossible to catch up because it's the foundation already. So then, <clears throat> so then maybe you then pull that boy to the side, find ways to catch him up, or have other boys <coughs> work with him if you feel that they have that clerk. There, there, I think there are ways around it, but I hear your point, 100%. Gotta get the foundation close. Start off. Okay, and then, you know, you find time to review. Rabbi said, I want you to know, I reviewed your papers yesterday, and I saw a number of you were struggling with this email. Uh, let, me, let me clarify, take a few minutes. I've done it in this session a few times, and you're extremely capable people, but maybe I wasn't clear. It was Begam and me. So I recognized the Begam, I went back to you to say it again, not because you weren't capable. It was, a, it was a limitation in my presentation. I think it was a formative assessment I did that. Because I was sensing it wasn't, it wasn't hot the way that I wanted it to be. So I, I, I said it again in a slightly different way, and it seemed that that helped a little bit more. So sometimes that's all you need. That's the beauty of written homework also. Journal homework, when you review it, so it's not like it's not a test, but rather sometimes the majority of the class got that first question wrong. You ask yourself, something's missing here. Yeah, you yeah. Do it, you know? yeah. Before you say it, if you don't mind, I want to piggyback on that point for a second. It needs a token for you to consider when you do a summative test. Um, instead of going, some of you may already do this, instead of going through Yangel's test, and then Beryl's test, and Schmerl's test, Kiseder, Take all of the tests and go through question one, all the tests, and then question two. I found this to be such a powerful way to approach it because often what was happening is that Talmud one got it wrong in some way. So I thought it was a big in Talmud one. And so I took off two points or five points, gave him more X, whatever it might be. Then I see, but it's hard to hold cup. It's hard to remember. But if you do them all Kaseder, then you say, you know what? I didn't teach number one correctly. Everyone gets it right. Whatever it is, or, you know, however you however you finesse, however you finesse it from that point, but at least you have a sense. You know where's the problem? The begam could be in you. It's not always a begam in them. It could begam could be how you wrote the question. The begam could be how you taught the content mitchila. There are a variety of things that could be that could be at the center of the issue. And we think it's in the Talmud, but man, fantasy. Maybe it's actually in us. Yes, go ahead. Right. So I've learned very often is that I have my testings, which has been asked to cover the questions for me. I have to try the stones and I have to see what is what it is. So just reverse the testing process, I find that you access a lot more what they know and where they're holding them just when they do it one at a time. And, and you do it one at a time? Sometimes, sometimes pairs, sometimes one at a time. So what are the other boys doing when that's happening? They're having fun to watch the other people. I see. So it's a show. It's a lot of fun. It's a show. Rebbe's on stage. Okay. And here, be consistent. Be clear what you want from them. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Now, um, so a quick review, which I think is good practice anyway. We've talked about the benefits and drawbacks of tests. We've talked about formative and summative assessment. Formative being for learning as we go. Summative being of learning on the back end. Typically high stakes. Formative typically low stakes. Okay? We talked about graphic organizers, ways to organize our information, and one minute paper. Now, I was actually brought, initially, I think, for oral testing. And so I'd like to spend some time with you to do that. Now, um, this is really a technique. 
And again, the disclaimer that I said before is as relevant here as it is. You're going to get a packet. It's going to have Gemara on the top and Chumash on the bottom. Now, the Chumash that you have underneath is a little bit more sophisticated. It's a Mikros Kedalos. But I want everybody to realize that it's about the system. It's not as much about the content. And the system itself is, in, is incredibly flexible. Okay? What you should be looking at for the purpose of for the purpose of um, just conversation, let's all take a moment and look at the Gemara, the first daf that you see over here. I taught a ninth grade class in Chicago, freshman boys, many of whom came from local day schools. Some came from the Solomon Schachter network. Now, if you're familiar with Solomon Schachter, it's a, it's a conservative, um, conservative Judaism, different type of focus in their learning, very little of any Gemara exposure. So I really had the game. So the way that I, the school where I was teaching um, set up their curriculum, we taught Phyllis Hashanah. It was often taught in fifth or sixth grade in uh, more Haim HaShachadarim, et cetera. And so you'll see here it's in Gemara Daf, in Brachos Daf Chavtes. Okay? Do you see towards the bottom of the Amud, the number one? It says Amr Avivi. And do you see two lines below it where it says a two, it says Ihachi? Okay, look to the right place for the moment to Rashi. You see the one where it says La Trude mm -hmm. and Betrilas number two? So piece number one in this particular case would be the Gemara from one to two and the Rashi marked by the number one. Everybody with me? Number two, the same thing. Okay, if you flip over to the next side, which is Chavtas and Abeis, you see the numbers continue. This particular test, I wasn't testing for tosis. Okay, but often, actually there was, number 10 is a tosis. So if you look at Ika da Amri in the Gemara, which is in the margin about a quarter of the way down, it says 10 plus tosis. You see that? And then you'll see the tosis on the bottom of the page also as a number 10. Everybody with me so far? How many pieces are there total in this Gemara, the way that I marked it up? Total number of pieces. It's a, little tr it's a tricky one. It looks like 19, but really, really I had a loop back. There's actually 20. There's a Rashi Nachas Ruach that's number 20. So there are actually 20 pieces here, but you're right. It's here. It looks like there are 19. Okay, now let's turn to the next page where you have the Chumash. Okay, so you'll notice piece number one is Pasuk Aleph and the first Chalik of Rashi. Everybody with me? Piece number one is the Pasuk and the first Chalik of Rashi until the word She'im. Piece number two starts with the word She'im. Okay, and then uh, where did I go over here? I must have had some other... Before, just see, yeah, there's a Ramban. The Ramban on the next page is number three. Obviously, this is a more sophisticated class where we're learning Mepharshim. But keep in mind, it's less about the content, it's more about the structure. But bear, bear with me on this idea for a moment, okay? Uh, I'm giving you all of the, um, some of the pieces before we really begin. Keep in mind, Rabosai, as I do this and as I walk around, take a look at the slide, please, that's in front of you. I want everybody to understand what my motivation was. It's a lot of this is Chazara of what we've already talked about. Skill orientation, focus. I'm sorry? C1, you're getting You're getting, you're getting tested. tested now. It's okay. I, I notice your anxiety level to be relatively low, which is good. But we want a little bit. We want to make sure that it's healthy. Okay, everybody close your book. Don't talk to your peers. Pretend you never saw them before. I don't want any conversation whatsoever. Otherwise, you might lose 50% of your grade. Are we ready? Okay. That was close. All right, now everybody say, take a look here for a moment. Take a look at this sheet. Everybody see it? Uh -huh. This is a checklist. Does everybody see how it's numbered one to 20? How many pieces were on a Gemara sheet? Mm -hmm. 20, okay. What are the instructions? Check off the components you are prepared to be tested on. Remember, if you do not check the box, I will assume you're not prepared to read that piece. So I'm giving a Talmud the opportunity to check as many pieces as they're ready to read. Okay? Now, there's a catch. There's always a catch. Okay? This was, it happened to be sequence out of order. Skip the next page for the moment. Go to the final page. I didn't give instructions on how it should be uh, stapled, so it's my fault. Take a look at this one for a moment. The boy side, you are looking at a rubric. Did everyone see this? A rubric is a grid that has two basic features. It has a list of criteria and it has gradients of quality. Vertically are your criteria, horizontally is the quality per criteria. So for example, if I say reads well, Vus means reads well. 
right? When I talked to you before about your all oral testing, but are you really measuring, do, you know, do we know what we're measuring? This is what I'm talking about. So here, first of all, you'll notice the first of the criteria has nothing to do with the test. It happens before the test. Willing to read number of pieces, that goes back to your checklist. You'll notice, if he's willing to read 18, gets the full credit for that section. I gave him actually extra credit if they checked off 19 or 20, just by name. 16 pieces is worth reading. One time, I mixed up. Willing to read number, yeah. reading full credit, 18, I understand that. Okay, let me go through it a little bit more clearly. Thank you for pointing that out. We're checking for understanding. We're seeing that I didn't teach it very effectively. There are four, there are four criteria on this, on this rubric. There's the number of pieces that I checked. Let's go down vertically. There's displaying a firm grasp of the content, understanding the shock there, including giving me the background, what was going on before this piece began. Number three, reading clearly and punctuating properly. And number four, translating correctly. Is everybody with me? Who agrees and disagrees? Who agrees? Oh, no. I give you the wrong one. I have to, I'm going to email through everything over the, the, a better one. I have a better one. Um, there's one, this wasn't good enough. You want me to give it to me now? I'll it up right now. Yeah, well, the problem is I have to I have a That's fine. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can pull it up. You know what, I can do it this way. I can get out of here. If I can pull it up real quick out of my flash drive, then I'll do it this way. Let's see if I can find it. I'm a little bit in, in transition personally, so. I don't have exactly what I need, I apologize. But I will tell you, whoever asked the question, I strongly agree, you hit on a very important point. It was very fuzzy and unclear. And so I, I wound up um, revising it. You lowered my anxiety, I felt comfortable. There you go. I, 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 yeah, hold on a second. Let's see if I can, if, if this is the document. I want to first just confirm that this is a better version. If it is, no, no, here, let me do it with our little band right here. And then later I'll email it after. Okay, so take a look. Does this is work better? Much better. See? So now I've got exemplary, establishes a clear link. What am I looking for? I'm telling you exactly what I want. You've established a clear link to the previous discussion. You've presented it clearly, I understand, and you made zero to one content efforts. So it's measurable. Here, you've made two to three content errors. You're relatively clear, and your link to the previous Gemara is good, maybe not good. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm giving you details. What do you base your judgment on, though? In other words, as the Rebbe. As the Rebbe, you're still making a subjective judgment. You can't make this fully objective. There's no way. This is more objective, because if you read clearly and punctuate properly, zero to two, that's, yeah, yeah. that's easy to measure. Easy to measure, right? Three to five, easy to measure. And by the way, that's where this sheet comes in. Let's loop back. Now that you're looking on the screen, I can direct you to this middle sheet. This is your guide as you go. Because as the Talmud is reading, you put his name on the top. You already filled in the value because he gave you his checklist before the test began. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to you before I present it in a formal presentation. But it's okay, hopefully, we'll, we'll all come together. As he's sitting in front of you, reading, I'll explain how all of that works, you already know how many pieces he's checked off, so you've already given him his credit for number one. The point value is already on your paper. What you're looking for is two, three, and four. And as he reads, you have these lines over here, you're taking notes. You're documenting as he goes. If you can, you can record it as well, that would also be nice. This way you have some paper trail, and I keep coming back to that, but that's important, for the parents. What do you mean by something about, he says he read right, right? Okay, you're right, but unfortunately, this is where the the, 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 the this one is from. You have some kind of evidence to look back to, and frankly, you could bring it to the students as well. What I would typically do when I was done is have a brief powwow with the child and talk over, discuss with them what, what they got and why they got it. And if the child really felt indignant that I was unfair in some way, often I would go back and allow them to either compromise on the grade or reread it or something. You know, I would allow it to be somewhat of a fluid process instead of making it cut and dry. But here I have my, 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 com my, my documentary, so to speak, so that when I'm ready, I can plug in the grade, okay? Mm -hmm. So again, what the Talmud would get from the beginning is something either like this or a chumash, um, where they would have the psukim, and they would all be numbered. They would have a checklist, and they would be able to tell you what they're ready to be tested on. They would give that to you before the test actually began. 
And then you would have your criteria. I'm going to fill in some of the gaps shortly, but I just want to give you a basic surah of what they would receive before I start. Any questions about this? Not about this, but in general, is this done in front of all class? No, I want to come back to that. Now, by the way, Rabbi said, you can see how this works, right? It's hard to circle when I'm blocking with my shadow. Does everyone see what I just did? So you got two points? He gets three points because he checked off 13 in this case. He gets eight points because he read it beautifully. I mean, he explained it wrong because he's good at explaining. So he got all eight points for that. So all the But he only got three points here because he made three mistakes. And he wound up with only two points because his, his translation was good for Yeah, but let's so, say. So, so Sa Ha Kol, you add it up. He's got two, three, eight, and three. This would be a relatively low grade, by the way. Because we've got here three, that's 11. And another five, that's 16. That's an 80. That's not bad, Yeah, but actually. Yeah. But let's say he, he read, he was willing to read 13 points. Five, five, 13 of, them, the 13, five of them he read in the first one, and two of them he read differently. He only reads one piece. I wasn't clear about that. He's only going to read one. Um, the issue here, here? He, he, he's going to choose the piece based on his checklist. Sort of. Let me get to back here. We'll soak him up. So he yes. the I didn't get to that yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, when I go through it with you, you have a lot of great questions, and they're all appropriate. But bear with me. Let's go through it together. And if I'm still not clear, please make sure that I that I answer your question. I'm going to minimize this so we can access it a little bit later. Can I ask a technical question? Please. The, the, the points are arbitrary numbers. Why would you use real numbers instead of saying 20 is 100? Just saying. Yeah, that was that was. That was my own shtick the way I started. I don't remember even what the hyphen was. It could be 1 to 100. It doesn't have to be 1 to 20. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, those give, give equal value to what it's really going to be instead of... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would then just train, I would then just, you know, multiply by 5. I don't remember exactly why I did it that way from the beginning, but I just did it that way and ever since I, I'd embraced it, but it really doesn't matter. I, I find that sometimes if you get, if you, it's, it's basically the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Some people don't like Fahrenheit because it can be very deductive. It's 86, it's 87, but some people find that it's like the mine of at some point. You know, you have your basic range and the protein don't, don't really matter. Okay, predetermined selections. I told you about that, right? It removes the anxiety. I know for sure this piece will start here and it will end here. That's clear the Rebbe gave it to me on the first day of class. You already got it. You already know where piece one starts and you know where piece one ends. Okay? Rubric and checklist, you got those as well. The rubric law is that detailed information, how we're going to grade this. The checklist, you're going to check off as you go. It creates a clear understanding of the expectations. It puts the Talmudim in control. So he gets this, the, the Talmud gets the rubric? Yes, absolutely. Before the test? Yeah, from the very beginning. So if he's a Chacham, he can figure out what to do. You know, I'll, I'm, I'm going to write willing to read all that. Oh, we didn't know what I'm going to choose. Thanks. Yeah, so that's, that you don't get, trust to outsmart the system. Don't ever, trust me, this system is tried and true. Okay, <laughs> now minimum number of pieces required. Do you realize, look at the checklist, you notice maybe, Rabbi Sai, that on the checklist you'll see on the, there's a minimum number here. One point is 12. That means no Talmud can check less than 12. Because I know that some of you are saying, what do you mean a total whole Talmud? You know, I'm only going to hold them responsible for 60%? It's not the courses. Right? I can see, you know, that's the way I used to think. The reality is, you know, any testing process is selective to a degree. If you're getting them to study and you're getting them to really learn it and feel good about it, to me, over time, you're going to get everything you want. You're going to have them studying everything. You're going to have them feeling good about it. Build them up. Now, if you have a Talmud, and I think everybody here, it's a small yeshiva, everybody here teaches a heterogeneous classroom. That means you've got a whole range of Talmudim. You might officially say that the minimum number is one, is 12, but Yankel, who has learning challenges and really doesn't do very well in this context, he can read three. Nobody knows but you and Yankel, maybe Yankel's parents. He can read three, and you're going to give him the full credit for that first for that first line. Everybody with me? He doesn't have to check 12, but it's a private deal. It's a secret. Nobody knows about it. It's between me and him, right? We're also worried about cheating. We're worried about making multiple tests. You don't have to worry about that here. I give you the, stru the structure. I make a private deal. It's between me and you. I keep it very secret. Yankel, don't say a word. Now, Derech Agav, Yankel needs to know that on the next test, he can't just do three. On the next test, you want him to do four. You want him to do five, because you want him to grow. 
But at least let him start with something. Let him tell you on the first test. What do you think you can study and really be typhus? Okay? So we put a minimum number in there. They're checking off their pieces as they go. They're really in charge. Wow. Yeah, it must be the whole time. Really? So mine was here. So what I, oh, the, what I gave to me, the, the copy wasn't there. Oh, the children. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. So this is here. Yeah. I, I think Robert Berman asked this question before. Yeah. We'll copy the answer yeah. <clears throat> Let's say I know that there's 10 pieces on the test. Yes. Oral pieces. Yes. Okay, segments for me. And I only know four. And I'm going to check out, I'll check all, I'm going to do all 10. Yes. Yeah. The extra point. So I told my tell me mm -hmm. from the beginning. I said, you can take that chance. But. But. If I catch you. But no, it's not a catchy. If you if you wind up with a piece that you don't know, that's the piece you're reading. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you say the way that I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to jump ahead to answer your question. Answer your question. This is what I would do. Here's your checklist. Rabbi Zalman would go ahead and he check off the first 18 pieces. He wanted the full credit. He didn't know 19 and 20 so it was a tice. He didn't know it so well. Check off one to 18. On Rabbi Zalman's test. Before he began, he'd be sitting in front of me, I'll get to all that soon. I'd say, okay, pick a number 1 through 18. Everybody with me so far? Pick a number 1 Who through 18. Who picks a number? He's the he's the he, he picks a number 1 through 18. Who's he? The kid? The kid. Okay, so pick a number he knows. No, bear with me. Okay. Hang on a second. Okay, he picks a number 1 through 18. Now, what have I done to this paper before he starts? I put on this paper plus 6. He has no idea. I put plus 6. So he says to me, pick a number please, 1 through 18. 13. 13. So I start at 13. He's checked off all 13, so I just go right to 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, that's 5. Back to 1 is 6. You, okay, you read piece number 1. Did you what just happened? No. I made a code on his paper right. before he made a selection. Oh, you have That's to going to adjust. Okay. No, it's like this. He might want piece 1 because it's the Mishnah. Everybody wants the Mishnah. So he's going to say piece one. But if I wrote minus seven, so piece one loops me back here, seven spots, now all of a sudden he's in the Gemara, you know, a moment later. So why did you ask him? Because he has to make the selection. Otherwise, why? otherwise I framed it. And then the Rebbe's the bad guy. Well, anyway, you are framed. You are framed. Anyway, I'm not framing anything. No, you don't. I put the code down before he picked his number. So I have nothing to do with it. What I'm doing is I'm removing myself entirely from the process. You made the checklist. You checked off the pieces. You told me what you're ready to read. I'm never going to test you on something you didn't check. That I won't do. So what's the point of getting the kid with the numbers? You tell me. Because otherwise, where am I going to get the number from? I can't have him read all 13 pieces. I love you very much, but I can't listen to you all day. I have other Talmudians to listen to. If I'm the Talmud, I write that I'm ready for 18 Yes. Then yes. What do you need next part for? Just like, hey, now Zelman, go ahead and be done. Because I don't want Zelman, Rabbi Zelman, to come back to me and say, Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, Rebbe, you picked the hardest. I know I checked all 18, but I really, you picked the hardest piece. But it could be the hardest piece your way also. No. I know, but this way I have nothing to do with it. You, but, but, he could say, but he could still say that you did. No. no. I put my code down yeah, before. He doesn't know your code. He say you don't need I write it, I turn it around and I show it to him. I always do that. Okay, you, you, you're, too, you're too fast for me. That's the problem. This island is too fast for me. I will work. But, but that, <laughs> because you're bombarding all the issues. But they're all, trust me, they'll all be taken care of. I write down this plus six. You make your selection. I tell you now the plus six really equals piece one. And I turn it around here and I say, here, look, it says plus six right here. Schwarz on Weiss, right? I didn't make that up. You didn't see my pen go to the paper again. I'm not a magician, okay? So this way, it bombards any taina of the Talmud whatsoever that I had any implicate, I had any agenda input on, on, input on, on your on your outcome. Does that make sense? Plus. Yes, plus. It plus means it move it forward. Well, that's Minus means move it backwards. Oh, now, now derech agav, you do occasionally want to sprinkle in a zero. Why? Because the Talmud, if he knows that every time that he picks a number, it's going to slide as a mit as a, and he knows that he doesn't know piece 13, he picks 13. Got it? Okay? So sometimes he puts zero, so put he lands at zero. Do not go, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You're reading piece 13 on Slacha or others. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I don't need to, it's a question. Yeah, it's a question. Why do we have to do this whole thing? Why don't we just say something? You, Talmud, yes. you have to know the entire Talmud. This is something they give you before, right? Yeah. I divide Talmud into 10 pieces, 10 Talmud. I randomly have index cards, so no one could say that I chose something with Afghan. Right. And I call you to say a Gemara, so you can't get timing. If there's a weaker Talmud, 
who I'm in contact with the parents or the ward themselves. So I was really, this Gemara and really studied. Could I, could I, could I say this Gemara, right? I would give them the Gemara without anyone knowing. Okay, so the answer is you don't need to do this. In fact, the Rebbe, whose system I borrowed and then I'd like to think enhanced further, I'll mention that Rebbe Shua Kagan office my Rebbe in seventh grade orders, it's similar to what you're describing. Totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I just, to me, it's more fun. It involves the Talmud and more. They feel that they have complete ownership of the process, and it takes the Rebbe completely out of it, and it just makes me the assessor. That's all I'm doing. I'm not driving it in any way. You don't want to do it, it's fine. But I think it's fun. It doesn't add any, any, any extra time, really. And ultimately, I think the Talmud and enjoy it. Yes? Where is it written? Is it written on their paper or your paper? What's the no, it? What's the, the magic oh, number? They have to hand this in to me. Because I need to know how many pieces they've checked. Okay. When I have it, remember, I'm already using that to fill in line one on this paper. Because I'm already making the assessment of how many pieces they've checked off. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving them credit for it. Mm -hmm. So this paper says, Chaim Yankel. Okay? Puts the checks in all the various places. Now, on his paper, before Chaim Yankel picks his piece, I do my code. He picks his number. I calculate it. I turn it around and show him, this is what you get. You have a couple of minutes now to review it. I'm going to test you shortly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll get to that soon. All right? Let's continue. Checklist we discussed. Okay, now, this is a brief spiel on rubrics. I think we already mentioned a lot of it already, but it's good to see the quote. Rubrics are excellent assessment tools. They make assessing student work quick and efficient, and they help teachers justify, we talked about parents before, the parents and others, the grades they assign to students. Rubrics, at the very best, are teaching tools that support student learning and encourage the development of sophisticated thinking skills. Again, you're saying, what am I after? Right? What does the Rebbe want from me? What's going to constitute success? It's such a difference. I was having a conversation with my professor in graduate school on the doctoral level because I wasn't clear what he wanted from me. And we had to literally have a conversation. It was like a WebEx, a whole to do with a few of the students because we were all getting feedback that he wasn't so freedom with our responses. We literally had to flush it out. So this is a tool to help you flush it out. The Rebbe wants to see me read correctly. He wants to see that I'm punctuating properly. He wants to know that I have Clark height and I can explain it effectively. This is what he wants from me. Okay? And by doing it this way, I know when I prepare, so often, I see with my own children, but I've seen with my family too, they don't know how to prepare. They just, they have the notes. It's not like they're not listening in class, but they don't have the tools to really bring it to the very end. So what does this do for that? This gives them more Clark height about what it is that you want as they're preparing the demo. Or the so they go ahead of time, they see the group ahead of time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Okay? Gemara Reish Longish. Tell me they're struggling because they haven't organized their studies. Or on Antinus. Okay, moving along again because of time. Now this, to me, is a very powerful thing. We, we, we talked earlier today about Me'akot Halapo. There are a lot of people out there whose potential is developing. You probably had people in your class who were very, very high achievers, maybe in the classroom. And then when life came around, maybe they kind of came back to the pack a little bit. And then you had people who never distinguished themselves. And when, when they came into the real world, as they call it, all of a sudden became shining stars, very much Leah, financially doing very well, whatever that might be. Or they became great contributors to the club. And in the classroom, they were okay, you know, nothing special. Often, success in life is about how you utilize the gifts that a Baruch has given you. The more you help your Talmudim appreciate their gifts and channel them in the proper direction, the more they're going to get out of it than if you don't do that. In a classroom environment, how there's such limitations in the classroom. Like, there, there, are more limit, there are more limitations in the classroom, for sure. Because I might be great with my hands, and I might be the world's greatest plumber when I grew up. And you're right, the classroom doesn't give me as much. That's a whole spiel on authentic assessments, a different presentation that I do. Because that's, taught, that's a little bit, I borrowed that bullet that you were dinting with before about skills versus recall. That's where that came from. Because there are many things that we could do in the assessment level that tap into skills that people have that we really never otherwise tap into. Writing songs, poetry, games, maps, all sorts of things that kids who are visually, spatially very gifted. They just don't do so well in answering written questions on paper. So it depends a lot on the assessment. It depends on the structure. Absolutely. 100% must. Now this is Kathy Nunley. I referenced her earlier. To me, this is an incredibly, I'm sure there's a chazal or there's a, there's a, there's a Muslim safer that I really should be swapping out for her 
putting that in here and said I didn't have that in the car. So I would say that's your homework is to send that to me so I can do a more effective presentation the next time. But the Nakuda of having control is very important. People want control. It's a basic need for survival. If we are in control, we are free to learn, create, and grow. Are you familiar, by the way, with Abraham Maslow and the hierarchy of needs? That if our physiological needs are not in order, we can't really learn because we're, we, we, so often they show kids needing to use the bathroom or feeling unsafe because of the bully in the classroom, or whatever those issues are. If I'm not safe because my home environment is, is in upheaval, right? I know my own children right now. We're literally living in boxes amidst dust, right? The house that we were re rehabbing, we had to move in, wasn't ready yet. I don't know, hopefully it's not too much of, a, of an impact in their learning. But I can see, you know, you don't have a normal place to do homework. You don't have a normal place to put your stuff. Everything's a mess, right? It, it's definitely gonna be, gonna be difficult for them. You know, with the young children, hopefully by the time you know they get back to school, things will be missed dark. But we're dealing with it right now. The easiest way to allow students to feel control in the classroom is through choice. And frankly, we may not give so much choice in our classroom. That's something to think about. When students get to make choices in a classroom, they feel in control. And when they feel in control,